Hi and welcome to the first of the screencasts for acquiring movement skills. Today we're going to be looking at Whiting and Welford's models of information processing. In essence what we're talking about is how we actually process information in sporting situations. Uh, the models are quite complex but by the end of the session hopefully you'll be able to understand the theoretical models themselves and apply them to sporting situations which is going to be really important to be successful in the exam. So as I mentioned, in essence we're talking about how we process information. So how is this tennis player able to affect the decisions uh, he makes, have such successful outcome and react very quickly? One of the reasons we start with this model is that key topics within the model are also in different areas of acquiring movement skills. So if we can understand this, it will assist us in understanding the different areas. The process can also be broken down into subsections or different stages, and again, similar stages can be applied to different areas of acquiring movement skills. So to start with this uh, will give us a really good head start. All right, so in layperson's terms, what we're talking about is the inputs that a person receives when they're playing sport, so the information that they receive, that could be sensory information. For example, the ball. So the ball coming towards you is the stimulus. And then what we're trying to work out then is how does the player make a decision? They look at it and decide what they're going to do. So I'm going to smack it really, really hard. And then how do they actually carry that out? Once they've actually carried that out, what kind of feedback do they receive? This is an all an internal process and we're going to look at the technical vocabulary that's associated with this in principle. So we start out with the sensory input followed by the central mechanisms and then finally the effector mechanisms. So the sensory input as it uh, implies there involves our senses and this could be our sight, hearing, kinesthesis, lots of different things. We also have the sensory, uh, central mechanism and this is where the information is processed and it may be translated into uh, a different code that then can be sent to the effector mechanisms which is the final section over here where the messages are sent to the relevant muscle groups and then an action is actually carried out. So this in essence is the action. This aspect here is the thinking process and the decision making process and this one here is receiving information that will allow us to choose which option we actually want. So this is a copy of Whiting's model of information processing where we're going to start out is this aspect here. So the input, the data, and we receive this from the display and it goes into our senses as we've just identified in the previous one. But what do we mean by display? Well, let's have a look at that. Oh, sorry. So imagine you're the, you, this player down here. The display is everything that you can see, feel, hear, even smell. It's all of the aspects that are affecting your senses. And all of this display will affect you and how well you can actually perform. So all of this information is going into your senses and then you have to selectively attend to the relevant information that will allow you to be successful. So as we highlighted before, this is your sensory input. So if you were this golfer here, what would be the sensory input that would be impacting on your ability to take the shot? Okay, so you can see there he's got his eyes on the ball, so he's obviously taking that into consideration. But he's also got the kinesthesis of where his hands are, how they feel comparatively to the rest of his body, which is why we've got this, uh, this up here. So even the kinesthesis will have an impact on um, our successful uh, potential outcome. 
So we've received all this information from the display and we've sent this to the sensory organs. That will now be filtered into our perceptual mechanisms. So we're going to take a look at that. And in essence, perceptual mechanisms is the interpretation of the sensory input. So we've received the information and then we need to interpret what it actually all means. And we also need to, as, as I mentioned before, selectively attend to the correct information. Selective attention is about removing irrelevant information and it's about trying to identify the important information that will make us have a successful outcome. So we're going to have a quick look at selective attention and see how you get on with this test. How many passes did you count? The correct answer is 15 passes. But did you see the gorilla? <coughs> this video is from research by Daniel Simons and Christopher Chabri. Okay, it's quite an interesting one, that wasn't it? So, um, your brain's actually able to remove the information that you didn't need, and in that, you didn't need the information regarding the black players, therefore, you didn't see the gorilla. So, we're going to have a look at this little clip here and see what you think that the fly half, Johnny Wilkinson, has to try and remove. What information has he got to try and selectively attend to, and what information is he trying to remove? Okay, so we'll have a look. Okay, so that was a drop goal for the World Cup final in 2003. So, you, what information do you think he actually acts to attend to? So, it's quite an important point um, based on what sort of successful outcome we're trying to achieve. So, we've now got our perceptual mechanisms. We've received the information from our sensory organs, which is here. We've taken the information on board and we've worked out what information is important to us. So we're now going to move on to the next section, which is our translatory mechanisms. So with this information that we will have checked with our long-term memory, and we'll, we'll look at that slightly later on, we now move into the translatory mechanisms where we're transferring this information and we're trying to formulate what kind of, uh, some kind of decision. So in this instance here, you've got this player has more than one option. And in most situations in sport, you do. So this one, he could either drive towards the basket, or he could try and shoot, or he could pass. But you've got to try and work out what one of those you're going to do. And how you do that is in your translatory mechanism. You go to your long-term memory, and you check to see what outcomes have you achieved before and therefore you decide which one of those you're potentially going to repeat. Same principle for this tennis player. 
The ball's coming over the net at a particular height. He's received the information. Now he's translating that mechanism and he's trying to work out which one he's actually going to do. Just another example here in rugby. So you could either pass to your teammate, you could either show and go, or you could kick high. So there are several different options and you have to make these decisions using your translatory mechanism. As I mentioned before, these are identified in your long-term memory. So if you have experience of what's actually happened, therefore you can check in your long-term memory, see what happened last time, and then make a decision based on that. Doesn't mean to say you're always going to make the right decision though. So we're, we're now in this section here, and we're moving towards our effectors. We've decided which of our options we're going to take, and we're now going to try and actually manifest that through our effective mechanisms. So in essence our effective me um, mechanisms are the motor programs. We're looking and seeing which one of these motor programs we're going to use and then we've chosen one and we're going to run. Run like a banshee. That's what we're actually going to do. So this message is then sent into our effective mechanisms and it's coded to the relevant motor nerves within the muscles. And that, in its essence, is what the effector mechanism actually achieves, coding the impulses to the relevant motor nerves within the particular muscles. So after that, we're moving on into our muscular system. So the nerve endings send the messages to the muscular system and into the muscles. So as we had our guy running, we would be looking to use our legs, obviously, and from this, we would receive our feedback. How did it go? By running with the rugby ball, or whatever example you want to use, how effective was it? This experience, this new added experience, is then restored into your long-term memory. Ready for the next time this opportunity arises, you can then use the information once again to formulate the relevant decision. So where we're at now is here, this feedback. We're now giving feedback so that the next time we come up with the same display, we can affect a similar or different outcome depending on what actually happened. Okay, so here we've just got a little task. What I'd like you to do is look at each one of these different actions and then see if you can identify using bullet points a description of the process of information using practical terminology and linking it to the theory. So for example here we've got the detection of the ball over the net, absolutely fine. So that is the sensory aspect of the model. And we could also say that we need to attend selectively uh, to the ball as opposed to the other information that may be there, for example the crowd, the umpire. And then work your way through each one of the different aspects of the model applying practical application all the way through. Okay, in our next screencast we'll be looking at memory and how that works. Thanks very much. Cheers.